I got my Bowie t-shirt on. Yeah, I saw I, that. <laughs> I wore it just for... I didn't know what it was until you sat up in the chair and then I, there yeah, yeah, yeah. Had to wear it for you. So um, I love this movie and I think you did a really uh, almost eerie job of, you know, doing oh. something that would be daunting for a lot of actors to do. Maybe even more daunting than Rami doing Freddie Mercury to step into the role of Bowie. Was it daunting for you to step in to such a major role? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and definitely not something I took lightly. I was, um, yeah, I made, I made them, I made Gabriel, the, the director, kind of really audition me. Uh, you know, it was a, a conversation when we first met about like, how, is this going to work? And I was like, okay, well, when we get back to England, because he met me, he came out to see me in a play in New York. I was like, okay, we'll get back. We'll, um, you know, we'll do some screen tests and I'll try and do some scenes and I'll sing some song. You know, you just, we just do it step. I don't know if it can work. And we, we sort of auditioned each other in a way and auditioned the idea of making the, the story because it, it's not something that you just assume would, would work. And, mm -hmm. um, and we were kind of just gently encouraged by each step. So my, my confidence in it grew from, from just like, you know, going step by step really but it definitely was something in fact I tried to turn it down the first time I read the script I, I was like no way um nobody should touch that it's not something yeah. that should be done or attempted but then I realized what the story was that Gabriel was trying to tell and I thought this is really worthwhile and really interesting and it's totally not offensive because it's just about what it is to be a young artist um uh yeah, and, well, and asking yeah, those questions. No, that's it. Um, well, absolutely. That brings up, obviously, you know, kind of an elephant in the room question I have to bring up. I'm prefacing this by already telling you that I, I have seen the movie and I've enjoyed it. There has been a lot of backlash to the movie, which I think is coming from a lot of people who haven't actually seen it. And I think it is because, as, as you mentioned, David Bowie is, like you said, like, don't touch it. Like, it's so so near and dear to people. So how are yeah. you reacting to the fact that there seem to be a lot of people resistant to the fact that this movie even got made, you know, before they've even maybe given it a chance. Yeah. I think it's an interesting thing that, you know, the liberal artistic hero of freedom of expression has been, you know, talked about in a story and people are like, you can't, you can't tell a story. You can't tell a story about our hero who stood for freedom of expression. You can't free freely express yourself about our hero of freedom of expression. Anyway, I, I just, I think it's really, you know, it's the, it's the age that we live in. There's a, there's a certain nasty side to the internet um, in terms of like um, uh, cancel culture and um yeah i mean i don't i don't really mind i don't mind that people feel anything that they feel about the movie existing i i know that it's not offensive in its intentions it's 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 an examination of a tiny tiny moment it, it's mm -hmm. really a film that doesn't negate a big you know a big studio official biopic kind of film it doesn't it can sit along it's it, do, it doesn't mm -hmm you know you don't have to see the film it just is like almost like a journalistic like uh moment in his life we're just kind of asking the question like what was it like for david to turn up at this point in his life thinking he's a failure and also how did this how did this genius arrive you know a lot of people kind of see david arriving fully formed in 1973 as Biggie right. Stardust or whatever, but he he'd been trying for many many years and failing to to be noticed before this point. And and our film kind of asks the question like, who who was he at that very moment where it was where he was almost going to give up, where he was almost going to going to uh, give in to the failure of 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 what people were projecting onto him when he couldn't find his voice and and then we re and yeah we're realizing that there's this story worth telling about him rallying and meeting people at this point when he first goes to America that allow him to discover what it is that he has to say.
um, which is an ins I thought it was a responsible story to tell because it's it's we all need reminding that you know geniuses come from somewhere you know. So that ner are you at all nervous um, about that skepticism or back backlash that's happening? You know because obviously this film means a lot to you and you know yeah you want people to I give it a chance. I, it does. It means a lot to me, and I care. I care a lot about it because I knew, I always knew it would be a huge risk to do. I didn't I didn't take it on lightly. I was like, okay, I'm putting myself in the line of fire here. I knew that. I just hope that I'm I'm not so happy with the trailer. If I'm honest, like I think it kind of looks like it's trying to upsell the film mm. in a kind of cynical way. And I I think I think if I'm really honest. I'm, I, yeah, I just, I know what the film is and I know what we tried to do. And I feel like if people just saw the film, they would get it. They would be like, yeah. oh, this doesn't, this is like, this is, you know, this is interesting. You may not like it. You know, it, 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 that's, that's the way things work. You know, like you say something and people that either agree with you or not, but it doesn't, doesn't have to be canceled. Um, anything we do that's worth, doing or saying is 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 a risk and um you know I, I always want to take risks and I felt like this was one worth taking and um you know a lot of the noise it, when people see the film it seems to get great reviews um and, and a really good response and I went to Rome Film Festival with it and it was amazing you know and the the, the response there and the, the questions people asked and the, the recent reviews in, in in some of the newspapers in the UK and stuff uh have been have been amazing the, all the bad noise has just been about the trailer and the idea of the film and some of the some of the kind of yeah some of the kind of fake false information around it and i just think that's a symptom of the age we live in but actually, hopefully quite soon this, the film will, will will start to speak for itself well, it's interesting because I think maybe some of that early backlash was because of the, um, the fact that the family wasn't involved. Or, so there was no music in the film and people knew there mm. was going to be no music in the film. Without spoiling it for people who I, I do watch the film, I think the way they write into the plot, the reason why Bowie is not performing is actually very clever. And someone who works in the music business, something very believable. I'll just leave mm. it at that. But I'm curious for you as a musician in particular, not ha being able to having the task of having to portray a very iconic music star and having to do it without, with the exception of a small moment at the end, be really a performer and have to sort of convey that character through just pure dialogue and everything else. Like what were the challenges of that? Or was it kind of a relief in a way to be like, yeah. oh, okay, I don't know how to do that. It was, it was a relief. And it was one of the reasons why I thought we could, we could do this film because I, I i really wasn't interested in making it in a, a kind of jukebox musical i thought you know you, that's what the records are for you can go back to the to the albums um if you want to hear david singing those songs what i'm interested in is in the space between them and what motivated them and what um what he thought about that stuff that he was making at that time you know he turned he w he'd made this kind of pretty heavy rock album uh, in places the man who sold the world with quite a big sound and he turned up in america on his own with his guitar without the paperwork to be allowed to play live and what we do know about him at this time is he was in lots of scenarios he was running away from his own material when he was asked about the themes in the man who sold the world he kind of evaded the questions and and you know made up and said oh it's about drugs or whatever and mm -hmm. he wouldn't go in there and talk about the fears he had of, of mental illness and and mm -hmm. these things and instead he was he was you know was interested that he was he was playing a lot of um we have recordings from the time of him singing um you know Jacques Brel songs and you know French chanson and he was he just recently been doing um the work with Lindsay Camp the mime up mime artist and doing his, the avant-garde performances with him and you know and he was he he was obsessed with um anthony newley kind of weird vaudeville british singer who he borrowed the vocal style from the kind of wavering voice and and he was obsessed with the Velvet underground and we know that like on this trip he met andy warhol and he is introduced to iggy pop's music and stuff so all of that stuff we 
could have, you know, and right. to, to look at and examine and have him singing Jack Brown and stuff. And I, I was like, that is way more interesting than the David we know, because we know that other David. Let's look at the, the side of him we don't know. Um, that's what made it worthwhile for me. And, and so not having the music or having the estate um, authorize it was actually, you know, in, in lots of ways, a very creative um, uh, kind of leaping point because, hmm. you know, on the one hand, we, we, we have authorial objectivity, journalistic integrity to tell the story that we want so we don't have to answer to anyone. And, and also, it's an interesting thing to look at the music that, you, you know, you don't really know so much about from this period that he was obsessed with, he was interested in, and he was being influenced by. Um, and, and, you know, to the first point as well, you know, we're not, certainly not being disrespectful to the subject. This is a film made with a huge amount of love and respect for David as an artist, but also you didn't want to have to, um, you know, there's a danger in having to... Um, uh, consult ha have things approved and things like that and i think anything mm -hmm. like this you, you totally. can't necessarily trust it if, it if it hasn't been told with complete sort of you know objectivity do you know if his family will see it or has seen it or anything you know i know they're not involved but i would imagine if they would see, they saw it or anyone close to david saw it they would see the intention behind it and see i hope so yeah i hope so i mean i i have huge amount of respect for um Duncan and, and and you know love the films that he's made and mm -hmm. certainly wouldn't want to offend anyone. I just think it's it's it's. I think if, yeah, as you say, if you see the film, you you can't really be offended by it. It's just um, a very tiny personal moment in his life. So um, yeah, the intention was not to kind of upset right. anyone. Um, of course. Yeah. Did but you I don't see know if they've seen it. I don't know if they've seen it. Are you a fan of Velvet Goldmine by any chance? That was another movie which sort of obviously was very, it was not a biopic, it was, but it was yeah. very clear who inspired like the main characters in that. And that also yeah. did not use Bowie's music, but you know, um, did that, it's a different era. It's more of the glam rock era, but yeah. are you a fan of that film or did that I like, at all I like inspire that, you? I like that film. I think as a musician, yeah. I mean, the, you know, doing the two, the two things that I do, like I, any of those, yeah films about musicians are, are, are always interesting to me um and that was one of the more interesting ones um for sure and yeah i know i i, I know that todd haynes i heard that todd, Hay, todd haynes um tried to get the the right it was todd haynes right yeah he made that film mm -hmm. tried to get the right to Bowie's music and and they didn't allow it and then that you know that was his creative way of kind of working around that which is understandable i i yeah i like i i think that yeah i think that film's cool and and Super. uh and yeah it's it's great and i i just think it's time to embrace uh you know telling bold stories and yeah i don't know i I'd i, like I love i love doing this film i and it was a it was a huge risk and it was i put a lot into it but I, yeah it was a thrill it was an absolute joy you put in a lot into it physically as well. Like you lost a lot of weight. I, the teeth. Yeah. The teeth, te you know, you got the teeth, right? The if teeth. the teeth, <laughs> if the teeth had gotten, did you really keep the teeth? Yeah. I have, them? Them in, I have them in my drawer for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> Were they hard to act in? Cause you, and speaking and all that. They took some getting used to. I was worried if I, like, if at first I just had a really bad, um, lisp, um, <laughs> But they, yeah, they, they helped in a way like that. And I had a single contact lens in one eye um, uh, and the clothes, all of that stuff in a way was helpful to just, you know, make me feel physically different and, and, and believe myself in, in those situations. So, yeah, no, I like, I, like, I got used to it. You had to get the teeth right. Maybe if the teeth hadn't gone right, I would have been like, that would have been my complaint. But the teeth yeah. really sold it. But how much weight did you lose for this? Because obviously David Bowie was pretty, I mean, you're thin now, but like David Bowie was like very skinny yeah, in the 70s. He's, he's gone. Um, yeah, I, I lost two stone, which I, I'm going to look up how much that is in pounds. Cause it, is that 28 pounds? No, that doesn't. Or 14 pounds? 
two stone in pounds. 28, yeah. 28 pounds. 28 That's a pounds. lot. How tall are you? Uh, 5'11". That's a lot of weight. How did you do it? Was it a was yeah, it a rock? I did. I didn't. Situation? I didn't have a. I didn't have a huge amount to lose. I just. I mean, I was. It was hard. I was like, I was hungry <laughs> for months. <laughs> um, I did some sort of anaerobic exercise stuff. I was. I was just. I was skipping breakfast. It was quite hard because I was filming at the time that I was trying to lose the weight as well. I was doing another movie, so I was mm. doing long days, getting up really early, and just like feeling you know kind of weak um but i knew i you know it was it was something for which i i knew there would have to be um some sacrifices and i you know i'd gone into it thinking hey this is this requires a uh, sort of absolute this is not like a a dance you know flash in the pan you know this is like i have to go deeply into this to to give it the the, the attention and the respect it it deserves as a subject what was your favorite outfit that you got to wear on the film? You got to wear some cool stuff. I did. I loved wearing all of the kind of, you know, the women's blouses. It was so fun. I had a lot of fun with the costume design and just like being, oh, no, this one. Oh, no, this one. You know, <laughs> um, the first fitting that I went for that, I came away thinking, oh, this is going to be a, a joy just because it's, you know anything like that as an actor where you just are, are in a different um something that feels so different and and makes you move in a different way and wearing high heels as well and um i loved wearing the dress the mr mr fish dress and I, I you know i just thought that was that was a huge thrill and it's so of that time as well and i grew up with you know pictures of um mick jagger and and david wearing you know those clothes he, I recently I went to this um screening of the film in Rome and Mr. Fish the designer who made that dress for 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 Mick and David in the in the early 70s late 60s early 70s they they got in touch and they gave me a suit to wear for the for the premiere so I was like oh cool do you still have it I like do. was I it a loaner or did they give it oh, it yeah. was a loan I think I have to give it back it's sitting under my couch <laughs> with the teeth next to the teeth which you yeah, get to yeah. keep yeah. Well, speaking of the transformation, obviously there was a physical transformation to be Bowie, but there's a transformation within the film because you kind of, like in the end, you kind of had to play two Bowie. So there's like a time leap where most of the video, most of the movie takes place in what, 1971, Man yeah. Who Sold the Earth Era. And yeah. then it skips ahead at the end to when you transform into, into the Ziggy character. And it's like a whole different person, like super confident and, you know, kind of kind of the myth of Bowie we know. But for, yeah. you know, a lot of the film, you're this kind of more shy, little timid kind of, you know, um, not so confident David Bowie because of what you said that he'd had failures and was still trying to yeah. figure stuff out. So, like, how did you channel both of those personalities? Because it wasn't in the movie. It's not like a, a an evolution, really. It like time hops and it's like and a year later. Now, look where he is. And it's like a whole, you know, it's almost two different roles. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was uh, that was quite daunting for me because I was resting in this um, energy of the of the um, the, sh the retiring David for most of the time. And I just I just had my calendar like, oh my god, in like you know eight days I have to be Ziggy, you know seven, <laughs> seven days. I was like counting it down. They advertised in a local paper that was going to be a Ziggy show, and about four hundred people turned up um, to be the the crowd uh, in seventies costumes and stuff um which on the one hand i was really nervous knowing that that's what they'd done and the other hand it was a huge help because i had 400 like mostly quite drunk people on like first dates who were really up for dancing and that's a and, good um, first date yeah it was cool there were a bunch of people who just met on like tinder or whatever and like, <laughs> like let's go, go to, to this do you want to go to a ziggy stardust okay um Amazing. And uh, and I got off on the energy from the crowd. That was really that was really fun. And the you know and the guys in the band as well. Um, Aaron who played uh, Mick Ronson, so fun. Um, you know, dancing with them. And, you know, and we spent pretty much a whole day. 
we recorded more than just that one song and it's just we we i think that you know they wanted to have a few things that they could maybe use a couple of different and and at that point we still didn't know which was going to be the right song so we did like a bunch of songs and then in the end it's just mostly that one one number did you do um, bowie songs not not for the film but just sort of like to do b-roll to or whatever you you know to shoot to to sort of get in the we, vibe we did um we did some stuff we did um i wish you would which was which is the ron davies song which is on the ziggy stardust album hmm. which is i love that song um and it's not a it's not a david bowie song it's a cover and um uh and you know it, it would, would have been cool to I was I was asking them to use that, but I think it didn't have, you know, the way it had built up in the story was there was only really time to have like one big, one big number, and that song is is a slower paced song. Um, you know, when I climb to the top of the mountain, look how so it's they wanted something really like bang, you know, right? And, um, but it was fun. It was really fun doing all, all of those songs. And, and that was a great day. In, in a way, I, I was really terrified, more scared uh, of that one day than of the whole thing, just because I knew, like you say, it had to be this completely different energy. But it was funny, like something possessed me that day. I was just like, OK, I have to lose my shit today. I have to lose <laughs> all inhibitions. He's just like, you know, I was, studying the performances every every clip of him doing it and like all these little dance moves and flashing his bomb and doing his thing and um you know the clothes really help but mm -hmm. jenna uh jenna who played angie turned up that day to to be in the crowd because angie's in the crowd in our version of it and um it was so lovely her and mark were both were like oh this is like it's like we're hit if we're like we're like at a ziggy concert and it was really encouraging they 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 were just like this is so great you know the energy is so good and i was like so i i, I just held on to that and um everyone was so sweet that day everyone was uh, you know vibing and that uh, was cool it was really fun amazing well there's one thing i want to make sure i ask you about because you were talking we're talking about the evolution of bowie to ziggy to this final scene and we talked about how he had um, concerns about mental illness because it ran his family. And I, and that's a big yeah. part of this film about his older brother, Terry, who had, um, was it schizophrenia or bipolar, but he, he had mental illness. Uh, yeah. My apologies. I don't know exactly at the moment what it was, but it, he, he I believe, was, yeah, I believe it was paranoid schizophrenia. Right. Yeah. So I, I mean, people know about that, but I don't think a lot of people like the average person really knows about all that. And that, you know, mental yeah. illness is such a, um, you know, it's a topic people are talking about much more than ever. And the movie touches on how stigmatized it was that it still is, but it's how really stigmatized it was then. So how important was for you to sort of, you know, how do you feel this this movie, which takes place in 1971, kind of addresses the conversation about mental health that we're having in 2020? Yeah, I mean, I, that was one of the things that I loved about the story is it went into that and addressed it and, and like, yeah, at a time, I think it's hard to imagine what it would be like to be facing um, the possibility of, 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 yeah, to be genuinely afraid of, 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 of your mind breaking down at a time when there was so much stigma attached to it and, and yeah, no healthy conversation around mental illness and people routinely locked up or you know one of david's aunts was lobotomized oh wow um and you know uh lou reed has just gone through electro shock mm -hmm. therapy at this point you know it's it's a time when if you're if you're behaving in any way other than like you know this you know middle of the road you know you're 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 afraid you're taught to be afraid of of like um uh of any like you know s like deviance from like sexual norms or uh cultural norm anything you know and and david it's amazing yeah i think that's what makes him so exciting is he he just like he embraces all those um 
kind of kinks in his in his character and turns them into this wonderful artistic expression and becomes a hero for outsiders and allows people to be who they really are um albeit in you know makeup and you know and it's so <laughs> cool um yeah so we wanted yeah so I, that that for me was um he doesn't just arrive there he doesn't just like right. he doesn't, doesn't just like land you know in his space pod like fully formed it, it's somebody who's like worked hard and had to like suffer to 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 get to this perspective and point of wisdom and and then he and it's hugely brave every step of the way because he's he's being chased by these fears and demons and you know yeah so anyway that that's the story that we wanted to tell and um uh yeah and I think you guys did a great job. So thank you thank for you. doing it. I will just put this out there real quick. If there's another story to tell, I would love for you. And I don't know his name off the top of my head, but the guy who played Mark Bolin to reprise. I want a movie that's just about that rivalry because the Mark Bolin part where he's like, oh, it's so great how you keep trying and like yeah, he's so yeah. snooty. And I'm yeah. a huge, huge Mark Bolin fan. I was just so stoked that finally T-Rex got in the Hall of Fame and all that. Uh -huh. I want like some kind of Netflix series with you and him. <laughs> and like the like you know like uh the bet yeah. the feud the the, the bet um the betty davis and joan crawford but like oh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. mark and david david and mark yeah that would be cool they <laughs> he was great that guy i mean he and he's amazing yeah anyway i i, I know it's, it's the end but he yeah. that would be fun that would be fun get on that and when that happens i'll interview you guys together in the meantime thank you for this and i do encourage everybody watching this to check out stardust i really do think it is uh, really well done Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a wonderful day. You, you too. too.